Fabio. Hey, boss. How you doing? I'm good. What are you, what are you looking at here today? I've been snoring, I think, and not sleeping too well, so I decided to get a sleep study on myself. Uh-oh, we don't know how to read sleep studies. We better bring in a specialist. Dr. <gasps> oh, my Hello. God. Hello. Show your car. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. My pleasure. Have, uh, a lot of extra signals here. We're used to the EEG, but uh, we don't, don't know what we're looking at. Can so you help pretty. us out? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So this is a baseline polysomnogram, so a baseline sleep study. Uh, we often abbreviate that word as PSG. Uh, and so what we're looking at here is one night of sleep in the sleep laboratory. And so mm. what I tell patients when they get a sleep study is we're going to hook you up head to toe like a robot. So starting <laughs> from the top. Um, so these are leads you're familiar with, though they look different at this page speed, which we'll talk about in a moment. But these are our extraocular leads with a mastoid reference electrode. Mm -hmm. We have limited EEG recording here. Uh, so as you know, frontal, central, occipital, and then uh, are the leads on the left and right, respectively. Mm -hmm. We have a two lead EKG montage that we look at here. Mm -hmm. And then we have limb leads on the anterior tibialis of both legs. So that's how we're quantifying leg movement, which is here again, left leg, right leg. There's a microphone to capture snoring. Mm -hmm. And then N PRE here stands for nasal pressure. So that's a nasal pressure transducer looking at airflow, airflow through the nose. Mm -hmm. And then we have a nasal oral thermistor, which is heat sensitive again, looking at airflow through the mouth. Then there are two respiratory effort belts, one on the thorax and one on the abdomen. And then we have an oxygen monitor, the SpO2 signal. And this plethysmography is to corroborate the integrity of our SpO2 tracing. Some labs will do two SpO2 signals, but you want some way of verifying that that measurement is accurate. Hmm. Really the way that we measure sleep is through EEG. And so all of our staging and looking for arousals and things like that all comes from the EEG. So that's why we have the EEG here hmm. when we are doing a sleep study in the sleep lab. Like I mentioned, this is a limited EEG montage. If we have a concern for sleep-related seizures or for parasomnia or other things where we want a full extended EEG montage, we do have the capability of doing that. That's not the default montage that we use for a baseline polysomnogram. So why are there so many different signals related to breathing? You know, why, why not just the abdomen and thorax you know, belts instead of these others, uh, nasal pressure? And We are looking then at airflow through the nose and the mouth. We score different types of events off of these two leads. Mm -hmm. And we are looking at respiratory effort to help us identify the difference between an obstructive event in which there is persistent respiratory effort versus a central event in which we see that that effort dissipates. Oh, so we okay. put all of these together. Uh, when we look at limb movements as well, again, that's something that we can quantify to see it, does that correspond with a clinical history, perhaps suggestive of restless leg syndrome or other uh, symptoms that the patients may be describing in clinic. So this is a reason that we quantify and measure all of these. What do you think could be wrong with Fabio? He's, he said he's tired and someone said he snores. You know, let's see if we can figure it out here. Sure, let's dive in. All right, so we're gonna start from the top. The hypnogram is what shows us kind of the bird's eye view of the uh, sleep stages across the night. So you can see that here. So this runs from the start of the study at lights out to the end of the study at lights on. Hmm. And when you see different colors, that represents different stages of sleep. And so what I see here when I look at this, you see how there's a lot of flipping back and forth between yellow and green here. For mm -hmm. In our lab, that's uh, stage one versus stage two uh, mm -hmm. uh, on non-REM sleep. And so that looks to me like a lot of sleep fragmentation and a mm -hmm. lot of sleep stage instability going back and forth between those two stages. Mm -hmm. uh, this teal color here is delta sleep or N3 sleep, also mm -hmm. known as deep sleep. And then this brown here is stage R or rapid eye movement. REM sleep. So when I take a bird's eye view here, I say, okay, well, brain is cycling through different stages of sleep. So that's good. I do see some sleep fragmentation here and there kind of throughout the night. So that's something that catches my eye to say, why is that happening? Well, as we go through, we'll see, is that due to a respiratory etiology, for example, given the clinical suspicion for obstruction. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about page speed before, and when we do EEG, we'll often look at that at 10 seconds per page, as you know. Um, when we do our staging and scoring on sleep studies, 
the uh, recommended page speed is 30 seconds per page. I have this here at one minute per page because it's a little easier to look at respiratory events at a slightly higher page speed. So that's why I have this here. Uh, for us neurologists, it's a very different view looking at everything crunched together. So that does take a little bit of getting used to, uh, but that's the reason that we do it that way. That looks just like muscle artifact on the EEG there. <laughs> So, and you can see here a couple uh, premature ventricular contractions too. So that's just oh, something to keep, <laughs> keep an eye on as we go through the study. <laughs> too much coffee. Hopefully not too close to the sleep study at nighttime. Oh, oh there's something going on there. Yes. No? Yes. So yeah. when we see here, so we see what we're looking at is establishing a baseline level of airflow in this nasal pressure signal. And mm -hmm. then we look for a decrement in that airflow compared to baseline. So if there's a 30% decrement in airflow, then we score that as a hypopnea. Wow. But you need to have some aftergoing features or a consequence, a physiologic consequence in order to fully score that hypopnea. So that's the first thing is we say, okay, how long is this? And it's 10 seconds in duration, there's a 30% decrement in flow. And then there has to be either a 3% oxygen desaturation or a cortical arousal. Here we happen to see both that there is a 4% oxygen desaturation and a cortical arousal. So that's why we then score this as a hypopnea. We would yes. call it obstructive because there's persistent respiratory effort in the thorax mm -hmm. and the abdomen while that nasal pressure signal has reduced. Now the, the um, arousal, you, it looks like you're just noticing uh, that the EEG speeds up, right? Correct. It's, how long, why is that not a, you know, an awakening? Why is it an arousal instead of an awakening? Or yes, exactly. Actually, for the duration, that's mm -hmm. exactly right, because it's so transient. Um, okay. And so that's why we consider it an arousal. And here we would call this an a respiratory arousal because it's in close proximity to this. So, so you start looking at the breathing pattern, and then once established that it's, it's decreased, you look at the duration, and then if there's any consequence on the saturation or the EEG as awakening. Is that correct? As an arousal, yeah. So we are looking at flow through the nasal pressure uh, transducer and through the thermistor. So for hypopneas, which are these decrements in airflow, we are scoring those off of the nasal pressure transducer. We score apneas off of the thermistor. So we're really looking at both of those at the same time. And then the reason we're looking at the effort belts is to help us classify obstructive versus central, or there's an entity called mix too, where there are features of both. It's another good point too, that for uh, hypopneas, we need that aftergoing consequence of either a cortical arousal or an oxygen desaturation. For apneas, where there's at least 90% decrement in flow through this thermistor, we don't need that type of demonstration of an aftergoing event um, because we have such a dramatic decrease in flow. Here is an example. Oh. It's a little messy uh, when you look at the signals mm -hmm. back here. But again, we're looking at the thermistor. So you can see here that the flow is a little better and then it subsides for this event. But you see here that the effort has persisted. Yeah. And so that's why we call that an obstructive apnea rather than a central apnea. Interesting. So this would be really a mechanical problem and as opposed to a, a central problem where the brain stops sending the signal to, to you know, continue breathing. Right. I mean, we do think there are multiple factors that contribute mm -hmm. to the likelihood of having obstructive sleep apnea. Certainly, this is due to uh, <laughs> the, um, the collapsibility of the upper airway and, like you said, you know, persistent uh, respiratory effort. Whereas in central apneas, we do see that that is likely just lack of a central drive at that point to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, but there does seem to be an altered arousal threshold for patients with obstructive sleep apnea as well as we can see sometimes as we page through these studies and see such frequent sleep fragmentation. Meaning it's, it's uh, they don't wake up as easily or they wake up too easily? Too easily. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yep, it's just, exactly. Fabio feels pretty tired, so I, I think he's- Yeah, I mean, that could be attributable. God, actually. And I'm still trying to breathe there based on the drastic efforts there, right? Correct, correct, yes. And so it's that ink that, crescendo of respiratory effort that then you know, causes the arousal, the cortical arousal. Got it. If we page through, then we can see that. And here it says that the lowest oxygen uh, saturation here is 
Wow. And you see a pretty quick resaturation. And we do see that frequently with our patients with obstructive sleep apnea, that resaturation ha- tends to happen pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, depending on the severity of obstructive sleep apnea, then there can be the, what we call this chronic intermittent hypoxemia, uh, which can be very problematic in terms of the cardiovascular, cerebrovascular sequelae that can come from untreated obstructive sleep apnea. Um, Fabio. Impaired quality of life, sleep related <laughs> no bueno. quality of life impairment. No bueno. No bueno at all. So what do I do now though? So for patients with obstructive sleep apnea, our gold standard treatment is positive airway pressure, often delivered in the form of CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure. Uh, So for some patients, we will bring them back into the sleep lab to do a titration where they will get fitted for a properly fitting mask. And then during the course of the study, the technologist will try different levels of pressure to see what best normalizes the breathing so that it keeps the airway patent and minimizes and eliminates all of these scored respiratory events. Actually, so have we, do we, have we seen enough to make this diagnosis though? Do we, uh, or? So we would page through the entire study, which, you know, can yeah. be many hours of data. So I'm happy to do that with you. Um, I can also show you this trend, which is a little, it's an expansion of the hypnogram I showed you initially. And mm-hmm. this shows also the, uh, the respiratory events in addition to the sleep stages that I told you about earlier. And so I didn't want to, to reveal the diagnosis before we started going through this study. Mm-hmm. Uh, but oh, this yeah, yeah. here, obstructive apneas, mm-hmm. and then uh, hypopneas here, central apneas and mixed apneas. You can see that this is definitely severe obstructive sleep apnea, just given the high frequency of events here. Uh, and then this red tracing shows the uh, SpO2. So you can see what we saw in the page in the epics that we went through, how there's that quick reset, a desaturation, resaturation, and, and so on and so forth. And that cycle kind of perpetuating itself here. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see right now where this line is, where we are, we're in an epic of stage REM sleep. Mm-hmm. And you can see here that there's pretty profound hypoxemia that's happening in stage REM. And, and so you mentioned the, the term um, apnea hypopnea index. I index, think. yes. Um, so what could you tell us how you define that and how, how we would calculate it from these, these um, you know, marked events here? Sure, sure. So the apnea hypopnea index is the number of apneas and hypopneas per hour of sleep. So as these are all scored, then we generate a report that calculates how many of each event per hour of sleep. And so that becomes the index, the AHI or the apnea hypopnea index. And so that is a gauge, a lot of the literature, certainly insurance coverage often is predicated on AHI values. Um, are, you know, the, in the field, there is a lot of emerging data about looking beyond the AHI and looking at other parameters related to sleep architecture, other data that we capture on sleep studies to see, are there other ways that we can define severity and presence of obstructive sleep apnea? Uh, currently, the apnea hypopnea index is what's most commonly used. What, what are the sort of, what's, what would be normal AHI value? So for adults, uh, we use a cutoff as of five events per hour, uh, plus the addition of symptoms, of clinical symptoms to constitute a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea or an AHI, apnea hypopnea index of 15 per hour, regardless of whether symptoms are present or not. So you'll often come across these designations of mild, moderate, and severe with mild being five to 15, moderate being 15 to 30, and severe being 30 and above. So this is a severe case. Correct. All right. Well, Fabio, it's yeah. been a good, been a good run, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure we'll see you next week. No yeah. much. Find another one for AG Talk. Yeah.